My name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center uh, at Western Washington University. Um, I want to uh, just make a quick note to let you know that I'm that we're recording the lecture and intend to publish it online. So just keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> so the um, the ISC aims to foster uh, an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of technology. And the uh, Internet Studies Lecture Series presents leading scholars and practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology and its place in the world. So a bit about our speaker, uh, Morgan Curry. She's a lecturer in uh, data and society um, in science and technology and innovation studies at the University of Edinburgh. Um, uh, her research and teaching interests focus on open and administrative data activist data practices, civil society and democracy, social justice in the city, participatory mapping, and libraries of things. Uh, Curry is uh, principal investigator of the Culture and Communities Map Project, which she'll be talking about today, and co-leads the Digital Social Science uh, Research Cluster at the Center for Data, Culture, and Society. Curry earned her PhD in Information Studies from the University of California, Los Angeles in 2017. So with that, welcome, and uh, the floor is all yours. Okay, thanks so much, Dustin. Uh, yeah. So, okay, I'm gonna share my screen, but that means I'm, I'm now talking into the, the PowerPoint and I can't see anyone. And so Dustin, if, if you could moderate a bit. Oh no, Zoom lets you see everyone, Never mind. We've been using Teams, um, which doesn't let you do that. Okay, great. All right, so um, yeah, so thanks so much for the, introduction and and I will be talking about this project that I've been running since 2018. Um, so before I, I start talking about it, I want to find out from the from those of you here the Dustin or the the three the three um, guests, uh, have you all ever been to Edinburgh? Anybody? Uh, I have. I've, and I uh, cannot see the chat actually right now. I, I have so. not, um, but I'd love to go because of the climate and uh, my stepfather has uh, just a couple of years ago actually. Okay. And did you say you had, Dustin? Um, yeah, I've been to Scotland, um, you know, uh, a number of okay. times uh, some years ago. So it's been a while. Okay. So when people think of Edinburgh, they usually think of um, this. So they usually think of, um, this is the, the city center and it's the Royal Mile. And so this is a very historic um, part of Edinburgh that's on top of uh, what was a, a once um, a, a volcano and now inactive, but it's what it's where the castle was built. It's literally called Castle Rock, and um, and and this is also where most of the cultural, um, the kind of major cultural institutions are clustered, and it's also where the festival happens. So have you all heard of the the Edinburgh festivals or the Fringe Festival? Has anyone heard of that? I was there last summer. We went right afterwards. So ah, you've been okay. Yeah. So this this is what Edinburgh is also known for, which is supposedly the biggest festival in the world, in the sense that um, Edinburgh's size literally doubles um, during the months of July and August during the festival, um, and it is it becomes a completely different city. At least in the city center, it's so dense with people and tourists. Um, so this is what people think of when they think of Edinburgh. And so, so my talk is going to be about, about a project that's looking at kind of the margins and in, in, in part of Edinburgh, looking outside the center and trying to give visibility to um, cultural institutions and cultural hubs that are important to communities across the city that normally don't get as much visibility and that people haven't really focused as much research on. Um, so let me go back. So what this talk is going to be about. So um, I'll go over the, the kind of background and research questions of this project to set it up. Then I'm going to talk about cultural mapping. You know, what does that mean? What are these, what are the methods of cultural mapping and kind of introduce y'all to literature around this method. Um, there's, there's kind of an interesting and growing amount of literature on cultural mapping as a research method and as a process for creating um, maps of city, city culture. Um, and then I'll talk about some outcomes. So, so we ran workshops. So I'll talk about the outcomes of those workshops. I'll talk about some ongoing projects and next steps. 
And then I'm going to part with the more kind of theoretical part. I'm actually saving for the end. Um, so I'm going to be very, very descriptive up until the end when I'll part by kind of musing on the project and the outcomes and what I think that can reflect back on cultural mapping as a practice. So, um, so to start kind of the, the driving research questions. Um, so, so yeah, this project is really focused on the role that, um, that, that cultural institutions play across Edinburgh and its different neighborhoods. And like I was saying, the, the city center is very well known. It's very visible. It's also where the wealth is concentrated. And as you get outside of the city center, you get to areas of town that have never accessed the festivals. And some areas of town, um, you'll find people who've never visited the city center at all. And so a question, okay, so some, you know, kind of driving question we've had is, you know, what are the, what are the, the cultural infrastructures in those areas? And could we somehow reimagine festivals so that it reaches more people and is a bit more equitably spread and that the, the you know, economic and cultural gains from the festival are more equitably spread across the city. But in any case, um, so the research questions that were driving us in 2018, and we're still tackling these, um, so there's a kind of set of them. So one is how do we define a cultural asset? So who decides what culture is? Um, and then in, in addition to that, it's, you know, not only what, you know, what, what do we think culture is, but what are the important cultural hubs or cultural institutions in town? What do the people think, the residents here across the city? Um, then a second one was, what can this mapping process tell us about cultural differences across Edinburgh? So if we do this mapping, can, can, it, can it kind of reveal interesting um, traits of different areas and neighborhoods across Edinburgh? And then the third question, and this is the one that we're still really working on, two and three we're still really working on, um, but especially three, and it's gonna be our focus next year, is what, what might it tell us about access to culture and cultural equity? So what do these differences say about, um, uh, about, about you know, how well resources are distributed across the city? Um, and so to start, we looked at some existing projects. So I'm just gonna present three that were kind of inspired this project. First of all, has anyone like heard of cultural mapping before? I'm just curious to know, is this a new concept? This idea? It's new for me. It's all new. Okay, cool. So, um, okay, so there's, there's so many different ways of, of, at this point, of carrying out a cultural map. Um, so I'm going to present two that are very top down. They're not participatory um, and they're done by city agencies, <clears throat> but they, they, served, they, they presented kind of interesting models for us to consider, um, given that our goal was to, to ultimately make an online map that could be a, a resource, a public resource for everyone. So this is one done by Los Angeles. It's the neighborhood arts profile. And the goal here was for the city to map city owned assets and, and assets um, that the city supported through grants. And the idea was to see where they were distributed and then through demographic layers. So if you go to this map, you can select a demographic layer to see income across the city. So where are the poorest areas, where are the wealthiest areas and see, and they wanted to see that, that, that their spaces, which, which are free, um, especially the city owned spaces are, are free, that their spaces are accessible to people in some of the poorest areas. So they, so they made this map to, to kind of see if there were areas that, that they weren't reaching. So we thought that was a good model in a sense that, that it was important therefore to have, if we're gonna map space, we should also map some of these uh, demographic layers that gave context to the space. Uh, this is one that just came out last year in London, the London infrastructure map. It's very different in the sense that it tries to be totally comprehensive to map every cultural space, not just those owned by the city, but everything. And so it's actually kind of remarkable. It has, you know, tens of thousands of data points and um, so many different categories. And the point of this was very kind of economically driven. London, as someone was just asking, is it's incredibly expensive, and gentrification was was really take it, it meant the cult, arts and culture in London has has really taken a hit. So a lot of important institutions get driven out because they just can't afford it anymore. And so the the culture agency realized this was a problem, and so they wanted to both kind of track where spaces might be. 
um, folding because they can't afford it, but also help people who want to start new businesses or start new cultural spaces or nonprofits know where the clusters are where they can kind of get support or footfall. So that's what this is for. So it has very much a kind of city planning economic focus. And what we took from this is this idea of comprehensiveness. We decided, let's see if we can try to map as much as possible, like they did. But our focus is not at all, um, or at least it's not at all primarily economic or for city planning purposes. This one is a little um, a project that was done locally here in Edinburgh by um, a group called Leith Creative. Leith is a neighborhood in Edinburgh. It's a very kind of, um, it, it was, Traditionally, kind of historically, working class is where the docks are, and now it's become a, a, a hub of uh, creative activity. And so this was a grassroots participatory mapping project where people in the neighborhood said, this is what's important, this is what's in our neighborhood, and they mapped that, and that's that map on the left. Um, and they also created some kind of statistical data about the area. So this is inspiring to us because we knew we wanted to use participatory Kind of more grassroots methods and we also didn't think that you know a, a couple of researchers um, even though we had support from the city council um, could in any way comprehensively map the city I mean especially because I'm you know I'm not from here um, so we knew we needed to have participant local voices per, you know de determining what would go on the map um, so just real quickly the uh, the the timeline for this project so it started in 2018 I started finding funding for it and hired a project researcher who was remarkable. She had um, GIS skills, so she had mapping skills. She could, um, she, she could uh, if y'all know GIS, you might know Esri, which is the application we use on our website. She knew Esri, um, uh, ArcGIS. She was, uh, she was skilled in some, in some data science skills, and she had to run participatory mapping workshops back in Chile, which is where she's from, with indigenous communities. So that, so her, her experience was kind of invaluable to the project. And she started collecting existing data that we could just plot on the map. And so the council had um, open data. Do y'all ever talk about open data? Like, um, do you, does, that, does that make... That hasn't come up in the lecture series yet, no. Okay. So open data, I mean, all that means is it, that's a kind of trend among, um, among city governments to make city data available for citizens to easily download and repurpose. So, the, so uh, this project started out by, by getting a data set that already existed of all the libraries, um, all the council-owned museums, um, and all the schools. And so we, we started out with that, with this, these kind of existing data sets and plotted those. Then the second, um, the second phase was, was the cultural mapping events themselves. So these were seven um, events. We, re we think we reached around 125 people. And this is where we were saying, okay, what is a cultural asset? What's important to you? And, and, this, um, and, so I'll, I'll, and, I'll, and this is what I'm going to go in more, in depth, more depth about, is, is what, how we carried out these workshops. Um, this year, we were all about getting that up and online and so that we could share it with everyone and say, hey, you participated in this. Here's what's come out of it. And to start to do some analysis. And, and there's some kind of very interesting art, art projects have come out of it as well that we didn't even anticipate. And I'll talk about some of those um, in a bit. And then next year is all about, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll um, go into this in some detail later, but it's, it's going to be more about um, addressing particular communities um, that through our research we've identified as um, not being, being audience that have not participated or have not been traditionally well represented during festival season. So the question is why and how can we rectify this? Um, okay, what is cultural mapping? So I already asked if y'all had ever heard of it, um, but I'm curious to know, does anyone, like, what, what do you think of, um, if, if you're going to do cultural mapping as a method, what, what might that look like? It would look like using a set of geographical information systems uh, technologies to uh, map certain cultural patterns across a geographic uh, a geographic area? Pretty much. Ours was very, um, it was very lo-fi. 
to it in the sense that it was all paper-based. So it, we printed out big sheets of paper. We had um, pens, we had post-its, we had stickers, and we had people gather around and with their hands kind of get messy and write on the map and, and um, use their stickers to point out spaces on the map that were missing. That was one of the main questions. Um, so it's actually very tactile and it's a really fun way to engage people in research. People enjoy looking at maps. They enjoy positioning themselves in relation to maps. It's actually one of the most, um, I don't know if, if, if y'all have done much kind of um, original research where you might use interviews or field work, um, but I've always, I've, I've done that. And I've always found, especially when I'm interviewing people that I'm, that I don't want them to feel like I'm wasting their time or I feel um, that I might be extractive in some ways and, and they feel like they're giving a lot to me, but they don't know what they're gonna get back. With cultural mapping, it's, it's actually really fun. And, and I found participants really liked it. So it's a very, it had like a good energy or a good vibe. It felt like a good way to engage people in research. Um, so I actually really enjoyed these, these workshops that we carried out. This is one of three workshops. There were three hours each. So they were kind of intensive, but they went by very fast. And part of them were, were people plotting on these maps and, and pointing things out and, and discussing. And the other um, part of the workshop after a lunch was, was just a discussion. And so I'll, I'll go over what we talked about. But this, we also, um, in addition to these kind of intensive workshops, we also would just take the map places. <laughs> Um, we would just take them to events that were already happening and, and on FemCore we would just carry it and plop it down and people would just come up and interact with it as they wanted. And we wound up uh, actually getting a lot more, more data that way because for the workshops you had to sign up and we had to kind of recruit people. But this way we, just, we were just there and people were, people were already going to be at these events and so they could just interact with it at their leisure. So that was actually a really good way to, to capture more voices beyond those who self-selected to go to our workshops. Um, so we took this, we call that the itinerant map. We took that to four, four different events. And then the workshops, the three-hour workshops, we held in three, um, three different locations across the city. Uh, these are the instructions. And so I'll just go through this really quick because um, it tells you what kinds of data we were capturing, which I think is, um, feeds into discussions about the kind of um, uh, the, the research potential these kinds of projects have for, for, for um, gathering uh, data um, about place and culture. So uh, place yourself on the map. So just tell us where, where you live and where you work. And we collected no um, personal details at all. So no one's names. Um, we would ask people to put either a synonym or initials. Um, and then also most very important is, is uh, we ask people about the categories themselves. So look at the legend and tell us if, you're, if there are any categories missing. This is, this is kind of key because this allowed people to determine what they considered culture to be. So what, what categories do they think were important for capturing culture in Edinburgh? And at each event, this legend would grow. Um, missing places, this is kind of the most basic question and, and we captured most data around this. So the map also just kept growing after each event as we would add spaces. Um, and, and this is interesting because this is where kind of Google Maps will, you know, if we just were relying, for instance, on Google Maps to capture, capture a category, things just wouldn't show up that, that, that participants would be able to tell us about because they knew it, because they, they knew well their neighborhood. Um, the blue sticker is valuable spaces. So this is capturing quantitative data on the intangible quality of, of what you value. Uh, the red sticker, where, what are, we're going to infrastructure spaces that no longer exist, that, that used to exist, um, that, were, that were culturally important. So we're able to kind of track, we got a lot of stories about gentrification because Edinburgh gets more and more expensive and places that had to fold either because they were priced out or because festivals bought the space and, and now only use it during festival season. Um, and then orange places at risk, again, that was usually a place that people thought um, we're, we're going to go out of business soon because of gentrification, rising prices. And then the green uh, sticker are places that are very important to communities. And we wanted to emphasize kind of communities that are, um, in, in, that are deprived. This is a term. Deprived sounds, um, 
and so, I think it sounds in some ways insensitive, but it's actually, um, it, it, that actually tracks to an index that's very important in Scotland called the Scottish Index for Multiple Deprivation, where the governments have actually identified neighborhoods that are, that are hit by multiple problems, including joblessness, um, poverty, um, health, et cetera. So, so we were wondering what places are, are, hit, are tar specifically trying to target those communities. And then we also had some open discussions around hubs. So we wanted people to identify hubs. These are places that we define as um, representing all different kinds of art and we're also publicly accessible. So free for anyone to walk into. Um, also, what, what challenges did, did these people, uh, did people participants find reaching deprived or underrepresented communities? So again, again, we were just trying to get to this question of equity. Um, and then the open discussion is uh, open discussion on how the map, once we build it, what, what features people wanted from it. Um, and then this is just to show we started out with 95 um, assets, 95 um, data points you see over um, on the left hand side. And then by the end, we had 759. So that just tells you how many spaces we added through all of these events. And then down at the bottom of the slide, you can see um, the categories that we added because people asked for them. So we added, for instance, um, churches. We added other uh, forms of uh, uh, other spaces of worship as well, not just churches, um, festivals, community centers, um, uh, outdoor activities and open spaces, charity um, charities, and mobility. So we had um, we we started to add spaces that reflected. Um, uh, uh, where people in will, like whether they were wheelchair accessible or not. Um, this is another slide just showing uh, how these, how the different categories changed over time. So you can see, for instance, digital, a lot of um, spaces were added in the digital category um, in the last couple months of the project. And then you see mobility was added in the last month too. Um, whereas some stay the same, like libraries, that data set didn't change because we already had the definitive data set before we even started the workshops. Um, here, let's see, here is, uh, so, so say someone plots a new space. Um, this, this is just to show the fields that we would try to capture for each space. So um, we had a category area that just allowed us to capture more data that would make a space findable. Um, a subcategory, we tried to have a summary, like what it was, um, X and Y coordinates, a website, and then everything um, in the, the other columns, that's all trying to capture the, the more intangible values, like was the space valuable? Was it at risk? Was it, was it, um, did it, did, was it targeting uh, specific communities? And so those values we tried to capture as well. But this is mostly just to show how we were organizing the data. These are all the subcategories that came out of the whole project. So you, it, just, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so all these, these subcategories now show up on the map. So they're just for findability. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the, some of the outcomes you know, in addition to the map growing, what have been some of the other outcomes? And this is actually the first map, the map that we brought to the first event. And you can see the scale of this one and you can look at the legend of it. And then the next is the last map. So the scale got much bigger as people kept on adding in the margins and telling us the map wasn't big enough um, to capture everything. And then you can see how much bigger the legend got by the end. So this is just kind of the natural process of carrying out these workshops as more and more voices were, um, more and more participants took part and, and their voices were captured and, and the map kind of iteratively grew and, um, and captured more and more over time. Um, these are the most valued spaces. If you live in Enver, this means something. If you don't, not so much, but it, there, was, there were lots and lots of valued spaces. There wasn't much consensus around that because it depended on where you lived and what, um, what cultural sector you were from. What was interesting is that the community hub question, which is where are those spaces that allow a lot of different kinds of cultural activities and are open to all, there was consensus around that. So these are the, these are the hubs that these the people were quite consistent in answering that question. And so we decided 
because of the consistency to actually include that as a category on the map. Um, and then this is kind of the last takeaway from the workshops themselves before I go into um, showing you the, the website itself. Just really quickly, some, some themes that emerged from the discussions. So one was like debates, not surprisingly, people had debates about what, what, how to define culture. So a lot of people thought that we were defining it way too narrowly and kind of elitist. Um, so a lot of people thought, for instance, why, like why shouldn't, and I'd actually be curious to know what y'all think about this, but you know, why shouldn't nail salons or tattoo parlors be included? Because this is a craft, you know, these are craft. Um, these also, you know, these entail craft and knowing a, an artistic skill. And other people thought, no, it should be, you know, you should only include non-commercial spaces. So they, they thought the map was including too much. So there are these very interesting debates and, and I, I, we kind of talked about that as being, a, you were either a maximalist or a minimalist and what you thought should be on the map. Um, we also found out that there are many communities that in, in Edinburgh that some of the, um, the people who attended the workshop told, told us that they worked in communities that were very turned off by the, the kind of elitism and commodification of culture by the high arts, kind of visible high arts organizations in Edinburgh. And that they feel that cultural events happening in the city center are just not relevant to their lives. Um, so that's motivating a lot of the research we're gonna try to do next year. Uh, and then three is, is gentrification. So a lot of artists, um, the workshop was attended mostly by people, either artists or people working in art or uh, cultural institutions. They all talked about gentrification because Edinburgh just keeps, like the rents keep going up. There's, um, there's lots of real estate pressure and there's uh, government funding cuts just keep getting worse each year. So people are, are feeling, are, are worried about accessing funding. And my gosh, it's only gotten so much worse um, since COVID. So there's all that too, but, but we didn't know that was coming. Um, okay, so if, if y'all don't, uh, if you don't mind, I thought I would just quickly show you the maps. This is what came, came of the project. Hi, Roderick. <laughs> I just noticed you there. Um, okay. So tell me if y'all can see my Firefox now. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so here's, here's what came out of this project. Um, so after, so, so what you see here is the, the main layer of the map, which is the, 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 um, uh, cultural space data set, which came out of these workshops. Um, so here is the legend, and I'll just go through some of the basic functionalities. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but if you have questions, please let me know. Um, so, so here are all the spaces. Um, if you click on one, for instance, you'll, you can pull up some details about that space. So this is an art gallery, so you can get uh, the category, subcategory, the organization that runs it, a description, and a link to the website. So that's kind of the basic um, content that we have about each space. From there, you can do different things to sort it. So you can search to try to find a specific space. You can sort by, by neighborhood. So this is, and so this isolates spaces that are just in a particular neighborhood that you've selected. Um, and then, of course, you can sort by different categories here. So if you just want to see a performance, or if you just want to see performance spaces, first of all, here's the subcategories. We can just click on performance space and then just see those as pink dots. And again, you can, I mean, this also is very revealing because you can see uh, a lot of categories are, are, are concentrated, uh, quite concentrated. You can see kind of concentration in the center there. But this is just one layer, so um, so so this there's actually a lot more to see, and there's a lot there's ways to get more context. So, for instance, if you want to see um, what spaces are near cycle paths, you can click on that layer. Uh, bus stops, um, waterways, you can see what's near a waterway, um, and so so we have projects that are trying to make sense of some of some of this context. So, for instance, we have a project that's looking at how people could uh, cycle to these different to different cultural spaces using the cycle paths. 
Um, and then another really, um, I think, important layer is the the index I was telling you, the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. So you can see what, uh, similar to the Los Angeles map, you can see what cultural spaces are servicing areas um, in those communities that are that are um, subject to, to uh, uh, multiple kinds of deprivation, according to this index. And we have the 2020 and the, the 2016. Um, we also have uh, a layer for the slave trade. So this is, um, there are some scholars at the University of Edinburgh who study uh, Edinburgh's um, history um, in relation to its slave trading past. Um, Scot Scotland had more slave traders than England did actually. And so these are cultural spaces that have some kind of relationship to that history. And so we have the source material for that and then the website um, to some of those spaces and you can get a description. Uh, and then just one more I'll show you that's pretty fun is the street art. So we have, um, we have different murals on this map and for some of them you can get a, a, an image when you click on it. Sorry, it's not going slow. Um, does it have this? Okay. Okay, well, I'll move on from that. So, okay, so that's the map. Um, and those are some of the functionalities for it. And just one more thing to show about this is that um, all the data has descriptions. So it has provenance for where we got the data from and a description for it in case it doesn't make sense and a kind of rationale behind it. So that's, so, so we finished that um, in August of this year and launched it. And everyone who participated, we, we put on an event to show everyone what came out of the workshops that people took part in. Um, and just a few other kind of interesting projects that have come out of it. Um, one is a virtual tour of the street art. So this is kind of isolates that one layer and people can now go to a map of street art in this neighborhood leaf. Um, and we did this with the same people who did the leaf cultural map that I showed earlier on. But it allows you, it's in some ways a, a database capturing um, archival material and audio of the artists or of, a, um, of an historian of these murals talking about them and then accessing um, the photo and the websites of the people who, uh, who created the murals. So that was a fun project that came out of this. Um, and then one more I'll show you before I go back to my presentation. Uh, is that we also did interviews over lockdown with um, the cultural hubs that we identified through the research and talked to them about what they were doing during lockdown and how, the, you know, how they were dealing with it and how they were engaging with their communities. So we captured very interesting information about um, the kind of supports they were providing to their communities during that time. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing um, Firefox and go back to my presentation. Did it, oh, and before I go back, does anyone, ha, did anyone want to ask any questions about the website? If not, I'll just go ahead. So feel free to stop and ask any questions. Yeah, so there's projects that have come out of, it, out of this. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then moving into Moving into next year, our kind of next steps, what we are hoping to do and what I'm currently fundraising to do is to uh, work with, we're, we're gonna work with the Fringe Festival and with Festivals Edinburgh, which is 11 uh, festivals held every year in Edinburgh. Um, they're, they're right now planning to actually hold, they, they're imagining that they're gonna be able to, to have their festivals um, in 2021, whereas they had to cancel everything this year. Um, but in any case, we're going to work with them to try to um, engage in areas that have historically not engaged with festivals, and this is according to their ticketing data. And we're going to do this through some of these hubs that have been historically embedded in these, in these areas. Um, and, and these hubs are going to engage um, residents of these areas to, to, to essentially tell festivals how they can be more relevant to their communities and what future activities they want in their area 
and spaces where that could take place. Uh, and so we're going to do this through some more mapping workshops and, and we hope the outcome, the idea would be that there would be a speculative map resulting that can be that, that these that these community hubs can use to advocate for support for more festival activities in these areas. And the goal here is really to change the power dynamic that's historically been between festivals and a lot of these communities, um, which is that festivals usually kind of um, helicopter in, in a way, or their engagement is usually takes the form of charity. And instead, what what a lot of the, the, the community organizations who service these areas are saying is, no, we need to switch that dynamic and make it so that these communities get funded directly to commission the festival and determine themselves and kind of co-produce what happens in these communities. So that's, that's the goal for 2021. Um, so I'm gonna, this is, this is kind of the closing now, uh, but I thought I would end by talking about some lessons we've learned and also some kind of theoretical reflection uh, on, on, this, on this method. So uh, one, and, so, and, and then I think this, these are questions that anyone who wants to, to engage in, in, this, in this kind of method would, would also need to kind of grapple with these, with these questions or these tensions. So one of course is around, you know, is it, it, should it be participatory or not? There's a lot of cultural mapping projects now that, are, um, that, that cities are doing that are, that are closed. Um, and th that's fine, and the result can be a resource for the community, but they, they didn't necessarily engage the community in creating the map. So that was, of course, the case with Los Angeles and with the, Lon the Los Angeles map and the London map. And, and, and I would say oftentimes the purpose of those maps are, are to be very kind of policy. They're to drive po policy. They're usually to, um, or to drive planning. And this is very different from the kind of tradition of cultural mapping that is very grassroots and that engages communities in kind of collectively, um, collectively creating knowledge about space. And so, so, and then, and I think if, if you're going to have a participatory map, you also have to ask sensitive questions about how participatory is it, you know, is it, will the participation lead to something being given back to the communities? So that those are just, um, that's one dimension to keep in mind. And then another one is the, the type of data that's being collected because that's very much going to shape the kind of knowledge claims that, that you can make, make with these projects. And there's a lot of um, interesting examples of cultural mapping that don't try to capture these kind of tangible data points at all. They often will be about creating, um, getting people to come up with stories or memories or descriptions of an area. So they, they can be about capturing more intangible data. Um, and, and, and our project has, has I'd say it, it has, it, we, we capture that intangible data in the discussions, but they're not, that's not well represented in the map. The map very much lent itself more to capturing this kind of tangible data. Um, that said, uh, the, the, I would say the, the hubs data set in some ways is like a, a quantitative intangible data set because it, it captured um, people's feelings about those spaces as being important community spaces. Um, and then product versus process. So we think about this in two ways. So one is that the map is ongoing. It's, it's uh, as a web map, it's dynamic. Um, we have a, a, per, uh, anyone who, who looks at the map, if they think that something's missing on it, they can get in touch with us and tell us, and we can change, we can alter the map. Um, we also has, have to be sensitive to spaces that are closing or opening. So it's gonna be a, a process in that sense. Um, but it's also a process in the sense that Here, you're back. All right, excellent. Sorry about that, everyone. I have no idea what happened. Um, okay, let me just get through this last slide, literally my last slide. Um, Okay, can y'all see that? Yes. Is that good? Okay, okay, so let me get through this. So I was talking about process. I don't know where, where I got cut off, but, um, but the point here is that yes, the map reflects the process. So it's never a product because it's always gonna reflect the process, the processes that went into creating it. 
All right, so that's the point there. And then, I'm, and then, then the final kind of dimension that we look at is this idea, which some of you might be familiar with, of kind of the, the, the tension between treating a map like a representation, and this gets back, I think, to the same issue of, um, in some ways it's similar to this idea of the product versus the process. But this is the, the idea, you know, is the map a, a, rep, a representation? Is it kind of a passive representation of, of Edinburgh and space and culture? Or is it performative? And, in this, and what I mean by this is, and this gets back to rich literature from, from critical cartography and cultural geography around the, the power of maps and how maps, all, you know, if you put a map out in the world, and especially if it comes from um, a position of authority, it's going to shape the territory that it's trying to represent. So it's that idea. And so I think we, we talk about that with this project a lot because we don't want to, we, we are putting this map out in the world. It's, it's, people will use it how they want to use it, but we're hoping that, um, that we can be sensitive to that. We can be very sensitive to the role that the map could play. So we don't want it to be used, for instance, um, for some kind of policy agenda that we would disagree with. Um, so it's it just keeping in mind this, this idea that, the, that, you know, maps, especially maps that come from um, elite institutions like universities, um, that we have to be sensitive to that, to, to, to the position that we're in when we put something like this out in the world. And so I think the, the key there is to just continue to engage with, the, with communities and with the people who are using it and to continue to, um, to try to include their voice in the project. And there's, if, if anyone who's interested in this, in this kind of like critical cartography and this way of thinking about maps, there's great literature on it. Um, one I would point you to in particular is the last one on the slide, John Pickles, um, A History of Spaces um, and Cartographic Reasoning Mapping and the Geocoded World. That's a great book. Um, Harley is one of the kind of considered one of the founders of critical cartography. He writes a lot about the imperial history of mapping and its role in the imperial agenda. And then more recently, you have um, Dodge and Kitchen uh, writing a lot about maps, kind of web maps and maps um, online and the role that they play. Uh, and then Dennis Cosgrove writing about uh, cultural cartography and using maps as a part of, um, uh, as an artistic expression in and of itself. So there's, there's some good literature um, that I recommend on that, on this topic. And that's it. So if anyone has questions, just let me know. Um, and yeah, sorry again about cutting out. I don't know what happened. Thanks, thanks Morgan. That, that was, that's great, super. Great. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, so I think now uh, we can just have a uh, open for conversation for questions, comments, you know, um, I'm curious, you know, referring to that last slide, um, how, how you think your project sort of relates to that literature that you were, you were citing towards the end there, you know, like what, um, are some, are, are some of those, uh, uh, folks also doing sort of particip participatory mapping projects at all? No, they're, they're sort of more, that's more of a kind of critical history and evaluation of sort of cartography as a, and it's kind of dynamics around, you know, power dynamics, right? Yeah, that the last literature I would say influences a lot of the more, that, that literature has, the, it's been going on since the 80s. And, um, uh, and it was also in the 80s that a lot of the counter mapping started happening. And I would say that this kind of critical cartography, um, non-representational geography um, research influenced the more recent research on cultural mapping. So a lot of people who do cultural mapping projects will draw on that literature to theorize it or, or frame it or um, to determine the kinds of methods they're using. So we're trying to do that too, <laughs> in the sense that we're trying to do it in, with the kind of cri with critical reflection as we go about the projects, the different projects that are related to the, the workshops or, or coming out of the workshops. Yeah, it seems like a very generative sort of pro project, right? You're describing all these kind of sub projects that are build on top of the, you know, that build upon the work that you're doing. Right, like the ability. There it seems like it's it's there's a lot of rich possibilities for 
kind of more narrowed applied focused projects that sort of use the map as a resource, right? As a starting off point. No, that's, I mean, that's really exciting. I think there's, it also kind of the kind of, uh, you seem to kind of ride this fine line, right? Between a sort of like applied sort of activist policy oriented research and something that, you know, whatever you might want to call like a more kind of pure kind of, uh, um, form of research yeah so i mean that's uh i you know the hmm yeah i mean it, it well a lot of it is that since we put it out there people have kind of come to us <laughs> right, so the sure. leaf, like the leaf late map that that was that came out of us asking them for um pictures hmm. of their murals to put on our map and then them telling us that they do this um, mural tour that usually takes place in the fall and it was going to get canceled this year huh. and so we said well, we, we, why don't we make it why don't we make an online version so that you can still do it this year but it'll be you know it's a year of COVID so let's right. put so, it online. So, so publishing the map online the, has also opened up for uh, facilitated a lot of interesting collaborations it sounds like as well. Yeah, and then that's the same, the, the research that we're hoping to do next year, that's the same. The festivals came, came to us, um, or we were introduced to people at the festivals who were saying, oh, we think we could use your map to try to do outreach in these areas, which led us to discuss with the hubs in these areas that we've, we've been working with through the workshops and saying, festivals wants to do this, and the hub saying, we're tired of festivals just doing outreach in our areas. We want mm. to reimagine this relationship entirely and empower our communities to, to, to start to commit, they call it a collaborative commissioning model, to start to work with festivals to commission events in their neighborhoods rather than giving mm. them free tickets to go into the city center or so, dropping a lot of um, like packages of books in the schools in the area which right. is what the relationships kind of traditionally been like so um in the beginning of towards the beginning of your talk you referred to some of the open data efforts and mapping or like uh mapping projects that other cities have done right like uh london los angeles you, you pointed to that i mean i guess i'm curious to what extent you think about the process and the project as a kind of model within that for that space, like you know, thinking about how sort of participatory methods and this kind of open-ended kind of research process can um, could inform these other kinds of ways of working, right? Within whether it's like you know, open government data, you know, sort of uh, municipalities, local council, governments, like trying to um, you know uh, create sort of these kinds of rich resources for themselves but also maybe for communities that they're serving right i mean it because i guess to me what's interesting is like you have you're describing this kind of back and forth with different community groups uh whereas like a lot of those um other sort of projects i imagine it's it's just a one-way sort of dynamic that's not very participatory in, in its approach and probably the resources that they're producing at the end don't really serve or in, like they're not engaging with communities, right? Like it's, it's, it's used to maybe make informed dis policy decisions, but that's maybe about it. I don't know. I mean, yeah, the, I mean, I know the Los Angeles map, they, they used it more um, to just showcase what they were doing. They didn't mm. use it. I don't think they, it wasn't even for decision making. It was more mm. just to say, look, here, we're we're very nicely spread across town. Hmm. That's kind of what they did it for. Um, and then the London one, they use it to work with businesses. Um, that's that because, because I, I spoke to I've, I've spoken to the, the people who produce both maps. So I know you know they they were very clear in their intent about what they were for. But um, the London one is to work with developers and small businesses and nonprofits um, in terms of of city planning. Um, right. Goals. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not community oriented. So but um, how, you mentioned the local council briefly. How to what extent have you guys been sort of in partnership working with the local? Yeah. They funded the, the web map. 
So they didn't have anything to do with the workshops, the, the data, you know, we did the participatory workshops, but then after we did all that, they came to us and said, oh, we want, we want to make sure that gets online. Mm. Um, so mm. they gave us a pot of money to just design the, to design the website. So that was their role. Um, but now that it's up, they haven't, but yeah, we haven't really had as much, like, I don't know what they're, like, they might be using it if they are, they haven't really told us. Right. <laughs> so instead, yeah. yeah, so instead it's, um, instead the, the people who've kind of come to us have been, and, and I should say the festivals, they, they are very powerful for sure in, in, mm. in Edinburgh, but they're also non, they're also nonprofits and they're also, they've been also really hit hard this year um yeah. but yeah it was interesting that that they and and some of these community organizations are are telling us and and it's they're not using the maps to make decisions they're using them in the same way that we use the paper maps to like or we're imagining that we'll use them just to instigate conversation if they're not really being used for um having the kind of final word on what on you know what what uh neighborhoods look like or um in order to drive policy or anything like that they're sure. they're yeah. like a they're we're hoping they'll remain kind of a tool for doing research like it's the beginning it's a it's a research tool not not something that you can really get answers from i guess that makes right that makes and when you do those when you're presenting the 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 physical maps and spaces, right? It's like a, it's, you know, it's, it's a provocation for conversation, right? It's yeah, like it's a way to, kind of just, yeah, you know, I mean, that's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. No, that, um, yeah, I, I, I found that your point about sort of um, the sort of elitism or like the, the general question of like what's included or not included really interesting about, you know, what counts as culture. Because something that comes to my mind when thinking about this is like pub culture in the in the UK is seems like quite a distinct thing, right? And that that oh, that's my dog barking. Um, I'm gonna mute myself until he stops here for a second. It's okay. I'm used to dogs and cats and kids and. <laughs> Um, oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah, so he can just hey, join in. Uh, can I ask a question while we wait for the dog to settle down? Yeah. Please. This talk had everything. It had yeah, yeah. Dogs, it had dogs, it had maps. This was great. <laughs> it's really nice to see you. Um, Morgan, can you talk some about the, um, I guess I'm interested in the participatory mapping, and I'm also interested in um, what community work means in Scotland versus the kind of community-based projects that you did when you lived in Southern California. Yeah, I mean, so, so, okay, so the the only community, the only participatory workshops that I've done were those seven events that we did last year, and they were very much targeted at the cultural sector. So they were um, they were artists, they were people who already were employed at well-known institutions, or who ran these community hubs, which are different from the mainstream institutions. The community hubs are community organizations um that that provide cultural programming for people in areas that don't that don't have much cultural infrastructure but we were working with the directors of those so that was one set of i would say it was a lot of professionals you know and that's who we were targeting for that um we didn't have the capacity to target a general audience so we didn't include like the map one reason why it's very um kind of quantitative and we, we didn't include much of the qualitative values is because it wasn't a representative group of people like it, pe they told us what they valued but they that rep that was 125 people who didn't represent the general population so that's my experience so far so if we do more workshops in areas that festivals are trying to you know, target is the language they've been using um, I, I will be working with the cultural hubs of those organizations to design everything rather than us just doing it because those hubs are the gateway to those communities and they know the people in those communities and I don't 
I, I feel like, we, yeah, we have to be very kind of sensitive to and letting, let them kind of lead the design. So that's going to be a new experience. And, and this is something, you know, and, and, you know, I put on that a very interesting participatory event in Los Angeles with grassroots organizations um, with a few other folks. And that's probably what you're, that might be what you're referring to in Los Angeles. And again, there, we did not consult anyone that we just sat in a room and, and determined the methods we were going to use that day. Um, so the, in this, in this instance, it's all going to be very carefully designed with constituents or representatives of constituents, if that makes sense. So it'll be a new experience for me. I guess that's what I'm getting at is like in participatory design and also in counter mapping projects. I guess I just wonder the degree to which those methods and theories are considered um, transferable across communities. And so I guess in some way what I hear you saying is that they're not or that it means different things to do that work in different places. So I guess I'm wondering, do we need different theories and methods for all the places where we want to work? You know, community is doing a lot of work here. And so I guess I'm just wondering if that's where we should if that's what we're trying to do, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it, yeah, I think it's context is, is very important. Like even asking, yeah, I mean, counter mapping is adopted a lot of traditional cartographic methods. So, you know, like it wasn't, a, it was, if you read the literature on the history of that, the, it was always about the communities trying to, to use the uh, these traditional practices in order to produce evidence that would hold up in court. <laughs> that's very different from I mean cultural mapping is changed that so that's that's very specific to that time you know to to the counter mapping the early counter mapping and of course cultural mapping is so it's so varied it's there's so many different examples of it and it's been played out in so many different ways. So that there's not like one interesting thing if you look into the literature on cultural mapping is there's no there's no one that I know of has written like the, most of the research that you found on cultural mapping are anthologies. So it's not one person saying here's what cultural mapping is and writing a 300 page book on it. Almost all of them are an editor collating all these different practices that they kind of put together under the banner of cultural mapping. But I, yeah, I think it's, it, it is incredibly varied and I think it, and it gets in part to that question you're talking about of, of context having to, to play a large role in determining the methods. Honestly, the the, there, it's just kind of like anthologies that collect stuff that happened. That actually makes me feel better. Because <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is, I, I guess there's tension between like an academic need to articulate a theory or a method that applies in all situations or in most situations with these projects, which are always kind of ad hoc and always tied I, up with kind of specific power relationships yeah. at specific times and places. Well, so I feel like it's the sensitivity. It's like the, the, the research and the literature that we've been looking at around participatory methods and, and sensitivities, that I think could apply in, any, in many contexts. So, um, so I do think there's tools that you can draw on to, to be, very, very critical and careful about how these things, about how these events are implemented. I mean, artists who do sort of participatory kind of community-based, whatever, socially engaged art uh, have been thinking about similar issues for a long time. I mean, I, it, this, this artist, Harold Fletcher comes to mind. And, no, Harold Fletcher. Yeah, and, and like I'm he, um, you know, uh, I, I, I just hanging out with him on a, on a couple of occasions, he described his method as simply the hangout method, just hang out with people, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. My kids are going nuts. I don't know if y'all can hear that in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, yeah, same here. Uh, oh, we had the dog now. Here Justin, I think, I think that hangout method gets to the, the ambivalence I'm feeling which like the hangout method at first seems um, cool, it seems down to earth, it seems approachable, and it seems like anybody can do it until you think for a minute. And then you're like, actually, no, not everybody can just go hang out. Some people have to go to work. 
some people are not allowed to just exist in certain spaces. So that's kind of what I'm getting at. But it's like, it seems like simple, but actually the hangout method could actually be an imperial kind of like, you know, <laughs> colonial but, method. But, you know? I mean, look, you can make those kinds of criticisms again, like toward, or like points. Uh, I'm going to, any yeah, I'm going to. Project, you know, <laughs> like, oh, it's, it's, there's some colonial dynamic here. You know, Morgan's research is like now an extension of, you know, the, the, the state. You know, I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, no, I mean, I Morgan, very interesting talk. Super, um, super fascinating to see to see the project in more in more detail and hear your sort of take on it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Does I wonder if we have to, I suppose two students left. Any other questions? Good. Well, it's seven o'clock here <laughs> in Edinburgh. All right. Well, um, if there aren't any other questions, I think um, we should wrap it up. Um, call, it, call it a day. It's late for you, so you probably have things you, you need to go tend to, it sounds like. Yeah, it, it's really nice though, just to hang out and chat with you all. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, great talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks I'm for inviting me too, Dustin. I appreciate it. Hanging out with screaming children, but <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm. We can continue to hang out. I'm just going to turn the recording off now. So. Okay. All right.